All right, so we are doing the second video in this docu-series. We're going to talk about medical necessity, which you all probably heard these terms, medical necessity and the history of present illness or HPI thrown around, but we're going to go through what they actually mean and review two PCRs. So medically necess necessary means that the patient's condition required them to go by stretcher transport via a 911 ambulance. So Medicare has had a steady increase in reviews and audits since 2008. So they use this just code, used to just code the payment as medically necessary and pay it with no questions asked until people started taking advantage of the system or poor coding decisions. So they started denying claims and increasing the random audits. So the thing about medically necessity is that it's pretty subjective and not black and white. And that's why documentation is so important. Everything needs documentation to support the following claims. So a few things that you can ask yourself when you're writing your reports is one, is this medically ne necessary? Does it have the supporting documentation? To make sure you have your appropriate signatures, this is really big for Medicare. If there's no signature, there's no payment. If you don't have a valid signature, no matter how great the documentation may be, uh, they won't pay the claim and the patient will end up with the bill. And then three, that the level of service that you're providing them, ALS, ALS2, that that documentation supports the level of service. So the history of present illness, simplifying that term is what's going on right now? Why do we need to go to the hospital? So a good patient presentation sets up a good quality narrative, which is what do you see upon arrival and at patient contact? So I would say where the patient was found, what were they doing when you found them? What did they look like? A one line HPI really isn't effective in making that medically necessary claim. Those small details that you do see upon arrival but don't document them could be very important to include. So not necessarily looking for longer narratives, but just detailed and not duplicated. So just a short example here, uh, even like a STEMI patient that you would think um, they're very sick, but they were found patient standing, clutching and holding his chest with grimacing. Patient appears to be in distress. So we're going to go over some questions to ask that you can ask yourself when interviewing the patient. There's obviously so many things, but just to really hone in on um, specifics, you can ask them when, like time, when was the onset time of the signs and symptoms, right? This is super important. Does anything make the sign or symptom better or worse? Do they take any meds over the counter prescribed? Did they take anything prior to arrival um, for their chief complaint, which should be documented under medications? And then that events leading up to is a big one. What was the patient doing prior to the onset of these signs and symptoms? Has it progressed over time, gotten worse, or does something they do make it better? Because when it has been longer than 24 hours, is it truly a medical emergency? And the only way is by what was going on, assessing what was going on with the patient prior to arrival. So we're really trying to look for that root cause of the chief complaint. What was the patient verbalizing about their condition? What are they saying? And we talked about putting that in quotation marks to really validate uh, that piece of documentation. So for example, some people may say a 10 out of 10 pain, but not look in distress because everyone deals with pain differently. So what are they saying about their 10 out of 10 pain? Um, and just food, uh, food for thought, nice to know information is a seven out of 10 pain is considered a severe pain scale, seven, eight, nine, 10. And so that alone could potentially make the documentation make the patients claim medically necessary to go to the hospital. Obviously, we'll talk more about pain in a different uh, video, but that's just nice to know information. 
Again, what did the staff, family, or bystanders actually verbalize about the patient's complaint or situation? And then the patient's normal baseline mental status and normal baseline physical status. So those are going to be specific to their complaint, right? If they're confused or if they fell um, for physical status, the billing company will see that they're noted to be bed confined, but there's no head to toe assessment outlining the physical attributes as to why they're bed bound. So just simply saying that they're bed confined, there needs to be that supporting documentation in the assessment piece that highlights that component. Is the patient compliant with their medications? Could explain the current chief complaint, like maybe they weren't taking their high blood pressure or their seizure medications, um, recent hospitalization, doctor's visits, any recent illness or injury that is impacting their chief complaint, any potential drug or alcohol usage, and then is this a new onset for the complaint or chronic? And then if chronic, what is different about it today that is make asking them to having them call 911. All right, so we are going to look at two PCR examples and we will start with the not medically necessary claim. So both of these EPCRs are from this year, 2023. And they both came to me from the billing company saying that as examples of one or the other. Alrighty, so this first one, the response was for an ill person that was at a facility. History obtained from staff who complains of patient stoma to her colostomy being dislodged and protruding. It is unknown how this happened. Arrived to find the patient sitting in a chair talking to family on the phone. Patient is alert and denies any distress. Vitals are stable per staff. Patient is assisted to stretcher and interventions are put in place. Patient is moved to rescue and interventions are continued. GSC, I'm assuming is general supportive care given during transport. Patient is transported in a position of comfort, transferred to ER bed and report given to ER staff. So just a few things to highlight uh, as to why they said this was not medically necessary. Uh, that history of the present illness that we talked about which in this case is that their colostomy was dislodged and protruding. So the assessment really needs to be specific to that. When we scroll down and we look at the assessment, there's no abdominal assessment. So when we ask ourselves, well, what are the things that we would wanna chart for this? Definitely we would wanna assess, you know, it said it was protruding, but was their belly distended? Was it firm or hard or soft? Um, what were their bowel sounds? We would want to know uh, that stoma color. So a lot of the, some of the bags are clear. Some of them are not. Most people that have a colostomy are going to be very familiar with it. They're going to be able to show you, but we want to know if that stoma is pink or if it's cyanotic. We want to know if there's any bleeding. Uh, and we want to know their last bowel movement because if it's if this report says that the top here, it's unknown how this happened. So we don't really have that time frame to say, you know, how long it's been like that. So by asking when was that last bowel movement, when have you last emptied your colostomy bag, that can help paint that picture of the history of present illness. All right. So another thing that I wanted to highlight. Um, that the billing company is going to look at. And it might not have made a difference here in this report, but it's definitely something they look at. And it's the vital signs. So you can see that they did apply oxygen, but there's no O2 saturation for that. So I'm assuming that there was a need for the oxygen, but no documentation to support the need. So I would say this is this does violate protocol in the sense of it's not a complete set of vitals and for transported patients it's not two complete sets so we're missing that diastolic on the blood pressure and we're missing the oxygen you could potentially get a 
temperature on this person. I mean, they could have something going on in their belly, especially if they have an assessment of a distended belly. That would definitely um, trigger trigger you to get a uh, temperature. Also, I, we talked about assessing their pain, so pain score of their belly. Do they are they having any pain? It did say no distress noted, but I would still want to document zero for their pain score. So that is the example of the not necess medically necessary claim per the billing company. So we are going to look at one with a medical necessity. There we go. All right. Thanks for bearing with me. So this patient, this called, they were just. So I do want to highlight um, it's great that the primary impression is fever and the secondary impression is sepsis. So this is super important to utilize. We draw a lot of data off these primary and secondary impressions. Um, but it also paints a picture as to kind of what's going on with them. So they were dispatched for a respiratory complaint, but upon arrival, they found one patient lying in a semi fowler's position in bed in the room at the nursing facility. The facility staff stated the patient presented to the daytime shift nurses this morning with an acutely altered mental status and slight shortness of breath. According to staff, the patient's baseline mental status is alert and talking normal, and the presentation this morning was not normal. The staff stated the patient was being monitored for possible COVID, and they noticed the patient's family notified them of the condition and sent to the, wanted them sent to the ER for further eval. All information was gathered from facility staff due to patient condition and being poor historian. So that's a great picture of the history of present illness. It has a time frame of when it started um, and what was different about their mentation today. The assessment in the narrative says um, it's a great head to toe focusing on the history of present illness. So the patient was assessed, no new trauma noted. They were weight confused with slight tachypnea. Patient's skin was warm and dry to touch. Temperature assessment revealed the presence of a fever. Neuro exam was normal and CPSS was negative. Lung sounds clear. The patient had noted old contusion to the right orbit negative chest pain, negative abdominal pain, full PMS, and a sepsis alert was issued. So that's a great uh, assessment in the narrative. I'm going to skip over the treatment part here. Oh, I did want to touch on one thing. So to highlight, this is a great history of present illness. They got a temperature. You'll see they got full sets of vital signs. And they really talked about how it was different. Their baseline uh, mental status was different today from the call. With a few just tidbits, and I don't want to ever like pick apart documentation, but just helpful things for future uh, documentation. When we say old contusion, I would want to know the color. So just by saying old contusion, my question would be, well, how did you know? And so by charting, while it was a yellow or green, um, to me that note, I know that it's an old one as opposed to purple or red, right? And then with the IV documentation, um, great that they gave the bolus and that it was infiltrated. So I would just follow that up with, you know, patient denies pain to the IV site, no signs of, you know, erythema noted, no signs of swelling just to highlight that you know we know that IVs come dislodged but there was no negative effect from that happening and if there was that's okay uh, we just want to notify the receiving facility and then going down to the vital signs just real quick we got a lot of great vital signs here uh, so we do have two complete sets of vital signs um, just to highlight the SPO2. So the first reading was 77. Um, they applied oxygen, which was great, but then there was no reassessment of that SPO2. So we just want to remember to get that reassessment of any in intervention. And then pulse um, 
I would have liked to maybe seen a 12 lead here, but it doesn't negate the, ne the patient obviously had to go to the hospital and the narrative paints that picture. So that is just an example with some other helpful information. And again, just want to reiterate that if there's ever any questions about your documentation, about confusion about how to document something that you can always read out, reach out to your EMS captain. That is all Hi. Hi, Captain Smith. How are you? Good. I do have a few questions for you. Okay. Well, thanks for jumping on. Absolutely. So uh, can you just kind of go back and speak on the signatures again and what are the appropriate signatures? Just a reminder and when are they appropriate to obtain uh, one signature over another? Yeah, so we can talk about uh, signatures. I definitely want to delve into that, but just to reiterate that the patient is patient signature is the priority signature, the number one signature to obtain if possible. And then number two would be if they're unable to sign to really document that reason why they're unable to sign, that documentation has to support that. So um, even if it could be as something just like a broken hand, but that it's their writing hand and that's why they can't sign. So then you would have their next of kin sign for them and that's why. Um, so, and then if, yeah, so th th that's one and two. Um, I don't wanna go too deep into signatures because uh, I'm gonna do, I'll do a separate presentation on just that because it's a lot. Okay. That's great, thank you. And then a few more. Uh, what is the so what is the importance of the narrative that we write? And um, can you help to kind of dispel, dispel that it's not just important for our EMS cap captains to read, uh, but also who else is reading those? And uh, are they? Can you dispel the the myth that they're not really read? Um, uh, after we submit the reports. Yeah, so the narrative really um, validates what you did on the call and why, and any response to the why you did it. So you're 100 percent correct that it's not just their EMS captain looking at the report. It's people from every single report is looked at by the billing company. Um, and even non-transports and even uh, patients that even no patient founds are sent to billing. So every single report, and this is what it looks like in that PDF button at the top uh, allows you to view your report like this. And it's almost just like a checks and balances for yourself to say, okay, I wanna make sure that I have my times correct. I have all my procedures charted, my medications charted, my vital signs charted. Uh, because as you can see, I'm sure that these crew members did it and thought they charted it, but something just didn't cross over maybe in the, in the um, telepack. So uh, that's something that's really important to check is that PDF button. And then there's other people looking at it, such as the medical examiner. Um, anybody, the peanut, or anybody can request their record, their own personal record. And then lawyers will subpoena records for cases. So there's many people that could be looking at it. And just how we showed, I showed it is how they will, what they will receive when they request it. Okay. Can you, uh, can you kind of, discuss what the importance of, uh, while we're writing our narrative, what's the importance of putting the quotations? And then uh, additionally, is there a legal perspective to using quotations? Yeah. So the purpose of quotations is that when we say that validity, I'm not talking about the score at the bottom, you know, the 100%. I'm talking about increasing the validity that at that moment, in that time of the call, that's what the person said. So you're you're saying you're uh, verifying that that's what they said, and it's not somebody else's words, and it's not your interpretation, right? Because um, things can become very subjective. Or oh, I didn't say that. So in if something were to go get subpoenaed in the court 
uh, in the law, law, court of law, it is a way for lawyers to say, well, what you said. So it is a way for them to really um, go one way or the other um, based on, on what it is. So medi medically necessity is a term that we that is out there. And I never want anybody to chart, you know, because they want, you know, they want it to be medically necessary. So that's why we say to chart, um, to use these questions and really try to just outline what's going on with the patient. And by doing that, it's going, everything's going to kind of outline itself um, appropriately. So does that answer okay. that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So can you kind of tell us uh, how long is the process for an individual to or a patient to contest charges that they were that they felt were not appropriate? How long is this process after they've been billed um, and if they feel that they were improperly coded uh, for them to kind of fight the system and receive compensation? Um, yeah, so. They so we have up to one year after the date of the incident to build a patient. So we have an entire year to um, do that, and then if there's issues, usually within that time frame, they find out. I mean, I feel like they have as much time as they want, but one year is when it would uh, they would start sending it to collections. After one year. So then if they feel that they were improperly charged or if based on, let's say we have the patient that, uh, that, that the, the first report that you showed us. So this patient now has to fight to be compensated for a call that or for, the, for a transport that was likely med medically necessary. But now they have the inconvenience of having to uh, go do the back and forth to receive their proper compensation. How long does that process take for them? Or do you have any idea? I have to look into that. So they we have a number that we can give them. Um, that, so our billing company will assist them in creating a Medicare claim. And they're going to have to provide some supplemental documentation, probably from the hospital, like as to why, you know, I fell and I had a hip fracture and they're telling me it's not medically necessary. Um, or I showed up to the ER and then I was intubated and they're saying it's not medically necessary. So they'll want to see that documentation. And then it's going to be very subjective on Medicare's part as to whether they'll approve it or not. I don't have too much on that side of it. Um, but our billing company is great in assisting the patients with making a um, a claim to try to get their bill paid. We have about 61% uh, of our transports are Medicare transports. Wow. wow. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it would seem that our customer service would extend into how we document um, in the sense that we want to definitely help our customers or patients receive the appropriate compensation um, because they're they're already experiencing a stressful event and we should really make the effort to at least assist with providing the opportunity to relieve a uh, potential financial burden that they may incur. Yeah, I mean, it definitely just by being, so I always say to be, you know, by being thorough. So we want to be um, accurate in our documentation concise and clear. Um, and so by remembering that and using those tools that I just shared about documenting the history of present element, illness and really delving into the why, it's really going to help support that medically necessary claim without even having to think about it and even having to um, worry that it's not needing that. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time to put this together, Emily, and discuss this. I mean, it's a very important topic. With the yeah, of course. So thank you for taking the time. Of course. And, you know, um, if anybody has questions specific to this topic, because I know it's um, kind of a lot, um, you can reach out to Captain Smith, each send her an email, or myself, um, and we'll, we'll work on getting you an answer back. So thanks again. Okay.
Okay. Did I stop recording?